Tamara, guardian of the mighty Altamaha River. Welcome to the People of One Fire channel. This is Richard Thornton, your host. This program is about the mysterious and often forgotten province of Tama on the Altamaha and Okamogi River in East Central Georgia. It is mentioned in the early chapters of American history and then often forgotten. Typically, acquisitions don't even know what the name means. We're going to do a complete explanation of who they were, the significance of their presence, and what those words mean. I'm now broadcasting from the beautiful Nakuchi Valley. There's, there's been a break in our program production because I was in the midst of moving from a rat infested hovel near Dahlonega, Georgia, to this beautiful location. The Nakuchi Valley is one of the most important archaeological zones in North America. It contains a continuous record of occupation from the Ice Age up to the present. During the period between around 1000 BC to 1700 AD, it was almost continually, continuously occupied with dense settlements of varying sizes. There are no large mounds to speak of, except for the Nakuchi Mound, but everywhere there are signs of mankind's presence. And who better to tell you about the Altamaha River than a Creek boy who was born in the Okefenokee Swamp? That's not too far away from the Altamaha, and I spent many a Saturday and Sunday going down to the mouth of the Altamaha to go shrimping and fishing with my parents. The Altamaha River is the third largest river on the eastern seaboard. Most people don't know this. That's in water volume. It begins, as its tributaries begin rather, at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains and near the Atlanta airport. They come together as the Oconee and Omogi River at what is known as the Forks of the Altamaha and that point southward it is officially the Altamaha River. In early colonial maps the Oconee River was also called the Altamaha River. Research for this program began in 2006 when I was retained by the Perdita Bay Muscogee Creek Tribe in Pensacola, Florida to prepare a four by four foot model of a Tamale village. This was to honor the principal chief of Perdido Bay, Chief Bearheart Johns, who uh, actually was born near the capital of Tama on the Okamulgee River. He grew up in a log cabin, but he had no idea that those pieces of pottery and the signs of earthworks near his home were actually the capital of a great province. Two years later, the Muscogee Creek Nation contracted me to continue research on the province of Tama and to build a very large model that had more details in it that portrayed the capital the best we could. I'm now going to take you on a tour down the Oconee, Okmulgee, and then the Altamaha River to show you what the scenery looks like as you go closer and closer to the ocean. This is the source of the Okmulgee River in the area south of the Atlanta airport, believe it or not, Clayton County. This is near the source of the Oconee River in Jackson County, Georgia, at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Here there are many shoals in which the locals enjoy swimming, sliding down the rocks, and fishing. A little downstream, the Omogi becomes larger, but also deeper. It slows down, but still is fairly flat, fast moving, and in places where there are shoals, you'll actually have clear water that strongly resembles mountain rivers.
Once it reaches the fall line in central Georgia, however, the rivers slow down. They come together at a point where their form was a large lake. It's now just a series of swamps and, and bottomland farmlands. This is the forks of the Altamaha. Downstream from the forks, the environment of the Altamaha strongly resembles a tropical river. Often it'll have steep banks on one side where at top you will find, almost always find a Native American town site and mounds and other places not so steep. This is the location of Tama. Also down in the southeast Georgia, the river has parallel channels or bayous, very similar in appearance to southern Louisiana. They look like swamp, but actually the water is cool and generally somewhat potable. It's not swamp water, it is flowing. It is picking up water from artesian wells that cannot get into the river. So they form several channels which really can't be seen from satellite imagery. Also here you start seeing deep south type animals such as the alligator. You also begin to see large expanses of sand which are left over from the period of time when this was under the ocean or actually the coast. It, you'll see sand dunes, white sands, pink sands, but other, but it, it makes a delightful place for fishing or swimming if you can avoid the alligators and the, and the uh, water moccasin snakes. Closer to the ocean, the river constricts again. It actually begins to flow a little faster and you don't see the banks. Uh, the trees are stunted here because there are still sand in the soil from when it was under the ocean. And it has a very different appearance. Begin looks more and more tropical. The estuaries of the Parallel River are actually true swamps here. They're black water. And in this area, the bald cypress thrives in the fresh water coming out of the swamps. Then as you're close to the ocean, the trees become dense and tall again, but they're different species. They're much more characterized by live oaks. And near the edge of water is often freshwater marshes. They're intolerant to salt water. There's a distinct change. Here's another view of the area as you're approaching the ocean. You see the, the cypress trees, freshwater marshes, but no saltwater marshes. Now, once you reach the area of maximum length of the Thailand, you will see, which is about 11 and a half miles inland, you'll begin to see a demarcation between the pinkish colored saltwater grasses and then the freshwater grasses, which are shorter and greener. During the colonial period in, in, and 1800s, settlers would graze cattle on the freshwater grass, but they had to be careful that the cattle did not get into the saltwater grasses because too much salt would kill the animals. Now we're actually in the part of the great Georgia marshes, some of the most magnificent tidal marshes in the world and certainly some of the largest. Here, the grasses and plants are tolerant of salt water and they've adapted to a tidal rhythm of twice a day the water coming in and out which produces a special type of plant life and a rich environment for many different marine species to spawn and hatch and thrive as juveniles. It's an excellent place to go fishing. Here's a view of the Altamaha Delta. The river divides into many different channels, They're actually much deeper and wider than they seem from this photograph. They were quite capable of handling large ships, even in the 1500s. The islands were developed into rice plantations, which continued to thrive until the late 1800s or perhaps early 1900s. 
when the cost of labor compared to growing rice in the Mississippi Delta area made this rice unattractive financially. At that point, the uh, rice plantation ceased operation. It is interesting to know, though, that the Altamaha Delta is the least likely place on the entire Atlantic seaboard of the United States to take a direct hit from a major hurricane. In other words, you're much more likely to be hit by a hurricane in, on Long Island, New York City, or Cape Cod than you are at Altamaha River. This is one of the reasons that is a location in ancient times for many Native American settlements. Okay, who were the Tamale? I think this is a representation of a, a Tama chief. Uh, I found this little bit of a figurine in the sand by the river downstream from the probable location of the capital. It's been worn by the water, but still shows most of its details. And as you notice, it could easily pass for something produced in Mexico. The, clearly, these people had a cultural connection with Mesoamerica. Many branches of the Creek Confederacy traced their origin to southern Mexico. The Cachita and Miccosukee had enough details in their migration legends to pinpoint the geographical location of their homeland. Both tribes originated in the territory of the Olmec civilization. Actually, the Olmecs had nothing to do with the Olmec civilization. They came around 1,500 to 2,000 years after the, the civilization existed, but it was a name given to them by gringo archaeologists. In fact, Mikoshoki is derived from the Itzamaya Shoki word Makoshoki, which means leaders of civilized people. It is clear that the same ethnic group dispatched immigrants to both Isapa, one of the earliest Maya cities in Chiapas, and also to southeastern North America. The Tamale Creek spoke a language very close to Itzamaya. Their proper nouns and many of their other words can easily be translated with an it's a dictionary. The remaining words in their language are either Muscogean, that'd be like uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, or Panoan from Eastern Peru. On the left, you see some of the key words that this clearly matches the two cultures. Itchy for corn, Mako or Mako for king, Ha for river, Hashi for a shallow river or, or creek, Tama equals trade. Tulaco means bean. Dula means town. Chichi means dog. Chia is a grain salvia, like in Chia Pet. Chiki is a house. Chilia means to write. The last word is, is especially significant because all the other Muscogean languages use a different word to write. But the Ishites, the Tamales, the other people in eastern Georgia who are of Maya descent used the Maya word for to write. That means they knew how to write. Here's that tomorrow at Tama. I get all sorts of strange explanations in anthropological texts and online encyclopedias such as uh, Wikipedia where people speculate on the meaning of Tama without really understanding the cultural history of the Creek people. Tama means trade or barter in Totonac, Ishamaya, and Ishiti Creek. Altamaha means place of trade river in Ishamaya and Ishiti Creek. Georgia Creeks use the Maya word for river, Ha, and the Maya word for stream, Hachi or Little River. You see that like the Chattahoochee River is a Maya word, believe it or not. It, its real meaning is ancient shallow river. Chattahoochee. However, Oklahoma Creeks now use the Maya word for a stream to mean both a stream or a river. That means that they will, anything there is called a Hochi, whether it's a river, stream, or creek. They really don't even have a word for, for what we call a branch or the water coming out of a spring. However, both regions still use the it's a suffix with small chi. Tamahiti means merchant people in Itchamaya and Itchiti Creek. The Tamahiti lived in Virginia mainly. They were originated in southeast Georgia, but they 
some point, perhaps around 1400 or 1500 AD, they migrated to the Virginia region where they were called the Tomahitans by Algonquin people. When the Cherokees rose to power in the early 1700s, the Tomahiti moved back to Georgia, and you can see their name briefly on maps of Georgia during the colonial period. Tomahiti, pronounced Tamali, means trade people in Nisti Cree. Tama means town in Chickasaw, Kancha, call are the call people of uh, now of Kansas and Oklahoma and Southern Shawnee. Tama means Indian corn in Middle Shawnee. Evidently, the Tamahiti introduced corn, Indian corn rather, to the Shawnee, so they named it after their towns. The Malipas, the Mexican state, means trade people, place of Initiate Creek. Now, you go to a reference from Mexico, and the scholars there don't need even have a clue what Tamaulipas means. That's because they have not connected to the Itzamayas. It has a direct meaning in Itzati Creek because Itzati Creek merges several languages, and it's fairly close to what uh, it's a T Itzamaya, excuse me, would say for the word. So Tamali Pas is a hybrid word that only now can be translated by a dictionary from the Miccosukees, or the Creek language. I think that's very ironic. The real name of the famous Itsiti Creek Tomochichi was Tamachichi. It's a pure Itsamaya word and means trade dog. This colloquial name probably means that he was an itinerant merchant. Tomochichi uh, moved to Savannah shortly before British settlers arrived intentionally in order to make a fast buck because it is uninhabited before that. He heard about their planned move and so he moved and said, oh, I live here, so you have to buy this from me. That shows he was a trade dog. But it, over time, he became good friends with the British settlers and there's a monument to him in downtown Savannah today. Here's a view of the Gulf of Mexico region at the time of the first Spanish explorations. Notice that there are three towns named Am Ishel. Am Ishel means place of the goddess Ishel in the Chantal Maya language, which is similar to Isiti, but from the coast of Tabasco. They form a right angle triangle. Each one was a major port for the Chantal Maya merchants. It's obvious they were migrating though because you have a, a perfect right triangle there. On the map you also see the locations of major towns in the southeast when Amichel in these three locations was occupied. It is believed that the Tamale originated in Tabasco in the heart of the Olmec civilization then dispersed other regions, and then some of their people came back later on around 1200. This is not known for certain because uh, it's really not a subject studied by any anthropologist right now. What we do know is that there are people living in towns primarily to the east and southeast of Vihamosa who speak a language which is very close to Isati Creek. And in fact, Miccosukees can travel down to this region and carry on conversations with the Tamalti or Chantamaya, the, the Savanas. In Tamalipas, the Tamali built earthen pyramids and then stuccoed them with uh, clay as an imitation of the stone pyramids farther south. I strongly suspect that many of the temple mounds in Alabama, Georgia, East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, and Northern Florida originally looked something like this temple, but the much heavier rains that we have here in the southeast caused the refinements on the pyramid to be lost over time the stucco would have just melted and washed away. Transportation 
between Mesoamerica and the Gulf Coast region and in this, at least as far north as Savannah was accomplished by seagoing vessels built in the same manner as the Viking longboats. They were very fast, quite capable of, of crossing ocean waters and had the advantage over Viking boats in that they also had houses or huts on, the, on them where the occupants could store perishable goods and also get out of the, the, uh, the rain if it was uh, stormy. Uh, these boats would have been capable of going as far inland as the fall line, but the shoals and waterfalls in places such as Columbus and Macon and Augusta and Columbia would have stopped this type of boat. At that point, they would have to unload any cargo and then load it back onto some type of dugout canoe or smaller boat to head inland to get as far as the mountains. The creeks remember these boats. Uh, they're called creek boat pipes. One way we know that they're, they did actually see them, though the upper right you see a boat that has rudders. Well, creek dugout canoes did not have rudders. And then in the lower right, you see the feathered serpent prow that's identical to the Maya boats. Around 1200 AD, uh, bands of, of what the Mesoamericans considered barbarians called the Chichimecas or coyote people came pouring out of the northern desert of Mexico and crushed several civilizations and uh, completely obliterated the Toltec civilization and captured the capital of the Totonac civilization in El Tajin. They continued to make raids against the remainder of the Totonac culture from then until the arrival of the Spanish, uh, but never completely conquered the Totonacs. These people still exist today. They have some customs that are actually quite similar to Muscogians, which makes us wonder if, if perhaps the Muscogians originally were Chichimecs themselves. The Chichimecs didn't speak just one language. So we do know that Muscogians came out of northeastern Mexico. They could have just been one of these tribes. Notice that these men are doing a stomp dance, which is a very popular dance among the Creeks. One of the first major urban centers to pop up after the, the people of Tamaulipas were forced out of their land by the Chichimex is called Bottle Creek Mounds. It's north of Mobile, Alabama. We're fairly certain that the real name was Mapale, which means place of trade in Totonac. It has a very distinct Mesoamerican feel to it. Notice that it has an inner harbor where canoes and, and trading vessels from across the Gulf of Mexico could be beached and parked and be protected against storm waters. The colonists of the upper Altamaha Basin originated in southern Mexico. However, they, many Tamalti migrated to the coast of Tamaulipas after the collapse of the Maya civilization. They were forced to flee after the Chichimecs invaded that region between 1200 AD and 1250 AD. The Tamale introduced the Green Corn Festival and a solar calendar beginning on the summer solstice to the southeastern USA. Yes, that's what I'm saying is the Green Corn Festival and many other traditions of the Creek people are really fairly recent and date to the arrival of the Tamale. Prior to that time, they generally practiced Maya religious customs and had a Maya calendar. Descendants of the Tamalti that settled Tabasco State are still the only indigenous people in Mexico who eat corn on the cob, start their calendar on the summer solstice and celebrate the Green Corn Festival. Yes, they also eat a lot of tamales. That's where the, the word came from. But we have descriptions of the Creeks also eating a lot of tamales. It's just one of those traditions that have been lost in recent years among the Creek people. They are identical in appearance to the Chitty Creeks 
in southern you still excel although the creeks tend to be much taller than mexicans because perhaps they better diet and and fewer parasites nevertheless mikosuke from florida can travel down to tabasco and carry on conversations with the tumulti de savano their languages are that close so anyone who says there's no evidence of the mayas being in georgia know nothing about the anthropology and ethnology of indigenous peoples of this region. The Hernando de Soto expedition passed through the large province of Tama in March 1540. His chronicles mention specifically the town of Altamaha within the province of Tama. When Hernando de Soto entered the Creek motherland in south central Georgia during the early spring of 1540, they were astonished to encounter a culture advanced people who averaged about a foot taller than most of the Europeans at that time. They were in the province of Toashi and the town of Toa. Now they, these people were not the same as the Tamale, but they were their next door neighbors. They probably intermarried with them. The Toa were Arawaks from the Caribbean. Nevertheless, the same description is seen wherever you, the Spanish went on the Altamaha River or the Oconee River or the Okamoke River. They had the same appearance. They wore turbans, they were extremely tall, and they wore woven clothing. The male leaders wore beards. Yes, they wore beards. The warriors wore mustaches. Female leaders wore turbans but shaved every day. Well, I'm just kidding about that. Obviously, they didn't wear beards <clears throat> if they were females. But the women also had equal status as far as uh, leadership in the community. All the people wore brightly colored, normally patterned clothing. The Spaniards were in the province of Tama, the birthplace of the Appalachian civilization. The Appalachian called that region Amana after the name of their invisible sun goddess, but by that time they had moved farther north into northeast Georgia. In essence, Amana was conceived as a female Yahweh of the ancient Hebrews. It was a, she was an invisible God, all powerful, the goddess of everybody, not just that tribe, and the creator of the universe. This province was located around the most southern sections of both Mogi and Oconee rivers, plus the northern section of the Altamaha River. Now, this is something interesting. Uh, we hear about Tama from the chronicles of the DeSoto expedition, then we hear about it again in the late 1500s when the Spanish were trying to conquer the region in the interior of Georgia. However, they could get no farther than Tama. They were told if they went any farther north than Tama, they all would be killed. And evidently there was a military muscle to back up that, that threat. In 1653, Richard Brickstock came up the Altamaha River through Tama and then entered the province of Appalachia. Even at that late date, the high king of Appalachia bragged that if anybody had tried to attack his province, he could have 7,000 warriors in walking distance of his capital. That in two days, he had to have 7,000 warriors. Apparently, the Spanish realized that they stayed away. So the fact that we speak English today, you can thank the province of Tama. Lake Tama is mentioned several times in the chronicles of 16th century explorers and some 17th century explorers. It was on the maps of, produced by colonial cartographers until the early 1700s. Contemporary anthropologists describe it as a hoax. That's not true. You can actually see in the satellite maps where the lake was located. However, the climate changed. As the little ice age waned, the lake steadily shrank. Its remnants now are the Little Okmogi River Swamp and several smaller ponds and swamps. We understand what was the creation of the lake from the comments from William Bartram, who came through this region in 1776. What he said was that even at that late date, the Georgia mountains had a very heavy snow park pack during the winter. Their name 
in the Creek language was the Snowy Mountains. When the snow melted in late March and April, the rivers in Georgia would flood and then southeast Georgia would be almost completely covered in water from the water coming out of the ground. He said that the Okefenokee Swamp was three times larger during the springtime and early summer than else during the year. Then it would shrink back. Thus we have the, the Okanoki Swamp being a lake at that time and then Tama having sufficient water to back up a lake there. Most likely it was something like a log jam or a major flood cutting of a sand bank that was the actual dam for Lake Tama. Bartram also sketched Tama as it looked back and that's why I was able to do a fairly accurate uh, models of Tama. Astonishing, even as late as 1776, the capital Tom was still laid out like a pre-Columbian Creek town and actually very similar to an Olmec town. We know this because William Barcher visited there and sketched the public sculptures of the town. It had all the architectural elements of Olmec towns plus a massive cone-shaped Chacopa which could hold at least 500 people. Chacopa is basically a large teepee. Here's a comparison of La Benta around 600 AD, 600 BC, excuse me, and a Creek Town in Middle Georgia in 1776. They have the same architectural elements. Now the, as we'll see in the next picture of, of La Benta, the pyramid at La Benta was much larger than the, the one at Tama, but in fact is virtually identical to a pyramidal mound constructed at Troyville site in northeastern Louisiana. Again, you see the same elements that one finds in the Creek towns and especially the Tamotley towns in central Georgia 2,000 years earlier in the Olmec civilization. Here's, let's take a look at the architecture of the Tom province. Now, what you see here is a piece of a figuring that I found in the sand along the Okamogi River next to the probable site of Tama. It has been damaged by water flow, but you can still see it had Mesoamerican motifs on it. If this item had been found in Mexico, no one would have argued about its authenticity. There is Tamale settled on the forks of Altamaha, it would have been a small village with Uh, Maya type huts are rounded on the ends. These still can be seen down in the, their homeland region. They were stuccoed with a mixture of burned shells and crushed shells and white kale and clay to have a white stucco finish. This was a common trait of all the towns along the Altamaha River all the way to the coast of Georgia. We see the same thing in the Villages visited by the Spanish near the mouth of the Altamaha River. White stucco houses that glisten like pearls. The towns and villages of the Tama province grew over time. They developed other styles of residential architecture from influence of neighboring peoples. But they still maintain the general layout that this can be seen in the Olmec civilization 2,000 years earlier. This would be a district administrative town in the province of Tama. Here's the capital, what it probably looked like, a much larger urbanized area than the, the district capital. Again, notice the format of the large conical shape and the rectangular mound facing each other on a rectangular square defined by earth banks. On the far left is the burial mound. Here's another view of the same town showing that it was facing the Altamaha River but also had a large creek coming in on its uh, north side. Another view of the town uh, from, from inside the river. 
the closer view of, of the platform mound by the high priest or the or the king whatever and then on the other end the chukapa the the supersized industrial strength teepee where the people would meet for meetings festivals and dances here's a model of the same thing we get a better feeling of the suburbs of the town how would the houses look like on the left and and on of each picture you can see the burial mound which have had a mortuary temple on top the palisades of the town were protected by platforms where archers could fire at their enemies on the left is the fortified gate for Tama and on the right is one of the many kitchen gardens they had large fields for growing corn and perhaps beans but other vegetables were grown, grown in gardens directly adjacent to the houses where the women could throw the garbage of each meal into the soil and enrich it. Here's a housing compound again. You can see the garden and the houses clustered around the garden courtyard. During the 1700s, the Ishiti Creeks either assimilated with the English settlers, moved a little farther north to get away from the British, or else moved into Spanish Florida, where they eventually became known as the Seminoles. When that happened, then small bands of Muscogee Creeks moved eastward into the Tama province. This is the probable appearance of the Creek Village on the Tama site during the mid 1700s. The region was ceded to the United States in 1805. Um, at that point, the Creeks ceased to occupy either the Altamaha or the Okmulgee River Basin. That was the end of its Native American occupation. There was never any Native American occupation directly from the Altamaha River and the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, which is commonly now known as the Trail of Tears. Thank you for being here today. This is what you'll see if you went down to look at Tama. It was abandoned. Uh, you will see red clay where there should be no red clay. This indicates where there were walls of buildings that had been made up out of a wall and daub. You'll see some earth banks that probably were low mounds like this, but you, it's very difficult to visualize the location being a major town, but that we know it is. It was a quite, quite a large town. Uh, it did not have heavy tree growth. Possibly it did have canals, but there's not have been enough archeological research to confirm that. But at any rate, uh, most people would never even know they were on a major town site if they passed through it today. That completes this show. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and will there be many more as, as the year goes on. We will be shifting more and more to videos and to animation as the year goes on. In this new location I have a special room for producing shows, a sound room, where we get all of our electronics together in one spot. So just bear with us as we become more and more sophisticated. This was an educational product that does not provide income from anybody, so we just have to crawl before we walk. Thank you very much for joining us.